Good morning. The reading of God's word today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 28 through 32. And Jesus declares, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are more, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving us this opportunity to come before your word and to once again stand in the presence of your glory. And it is my prayer that even though I am a sinner, of whom I confess willingly I may be the worst. Do not allow the frailties of this earthen vessel to stand in the way of the proclamation of your truth. And though, and though we all be sinners whose minds are clouded by the confusion of secular ideas and philosophies, I pray that you would not allow even that to stand in the way of receiving the word. That you would cause our minds to understand, our ears to hear, and our eyes to behold the wonders of who you are today. That you would speak to us and remind us that it is not the fear of man, but rather it is the fear of the living God Almighty that ultimately brings us to the one freedom that all of us can be had. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fourteen years and two days ago, a tragic event that seared itself into the memories of most of us who are old enough to remember, I would dare say assaulted the very collective consciousness of our beloved country. For on the morning of September 11, 2001, terrorists flew and crashed two commercial airliners into the north and south towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. One commercial airliner into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And one commercial airliner intended for an unknown target, but gratefully brought down by the heroic acts of the passengers into the fields of Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And what we found is that within a matter of hours, a few terrorists were able to succeed in taking the lives of 2,977 people. On that day, I remember very well, America stood still. And we together watched in horror as we witnessed and vividly experienced firsthand the overwhelming fear brought on by terrorism. And in response to this fear, Americans in one voice declared, we will never forget. Americans stood together and passionately promised that we would never forget the fear that we felt so deeply that day, and that we would never stop fighting against those who would seek to enslave us or any other people with such a fear again. And we committed. We committed as a nation to seeking out, destroying, and stamping out terrorism, no matter where it could be found in the world. But sadly, 14 years and two days later, 
most Americans seem to have forgotten. Both the promise and the fear. The loud cry of, we will never forget, appears to have been replaced with a more tame, we will try to remember every year. Yes, on September 9th, 2015, many could be seen gathering to memorialize and to remember the people and the events that took place in 2001. But many more people in our country appear to have passed the day as if it were like any other day. As if 9-11-2001 never took place. And as we look around the world, terrorism appears to be quite alive. And dare I say, well. Not diminished. And far from being stamped out. But how can this be? I ask you, what happened to all the passion and zeal that galvanized our nation into one people on September 9th, 2001? How, how could we have so easily forgotten the gut-wrenching fear, the very terror that moved us as a nation to rise against terrorism and hope and implement change for the good of our country and the world? In answer to this query, I present to you this argument. The argument that many have forgotten and will continue to forget. Because the fear of man, the terror brought on by man is temporary. And it in itself presents a weak argument for action and provides a poor motivation for change. The fear of man is temporary because man fears only that which is a clear and present danger. If the source or reason of fear, even healthy fear, is absent, we as people are quick to push aside the fear and to act, and to act as if the threat never existed. For example, all of us who drive we all know that when we're out there, the police are also out there with us, patrolling to help keep our roads safe. Thank God for that. And hopefully, most of us, if not all of us here, respect the police, and we drive with the conviction to abide by the rules of the road at all times. But no matter how conscientious of a driver we may be, there is no other time when we try harder to observe the speed limit, to avoid rolling stops, you know who you are, and to signal at every turn, than when we know that there is a police car right behind us. You laugh because you, you've been through it. <laughs> when I look into my rear view mirror and suddenly see a police car pull up right behind me, I will be the first to confess that I find myself grabbing the wheel with two hands like you're supposed to and tensing up, becoming a more defensive driver. I look at the speedometer often and make sure that I'm well within the speed limit, if not a little under it. And at every stop sign, I come to a complete stop and I take the time to look left and right and left again, exaggerating my motion so the cop behind me could see it, and begin to slowly accelerate. And during the entire time, I'm stressing out. And I'm asking myself, when is this policeman going to go away? How long is he going to keep on my tail? And after the police car finally goes in a different direction, I honestly find myself breathing a big sigh of relief. But why do we do this? It's because, honestly, the motivation of our fear, not the policemen. Policemen are not to be feared. But what the police could do if we break the law is right there with us. When a police car is right behind me, all that's going through my mind 
is that one, I could get pulled over, two, I could get a ticket, three, I could get points on my driving record, four, I could have my insurance rates go through the roof, and five, this I have to admit is my greatest fear, that I would have to face the wrath of my wife when I get home. <laughs> and so the moment the policeman disappears from the real view, rear view mirror, we usually find ourselves relaxing and less obsessed about the rules of the road because we know. We know that if we make a mistake, and all of us make mistakes, it just happens that when we make the mistakes, the police happen to be right there. The police won't be there to see it, and we won't be caught or charged. Likewise, the fear of man is also temporary because the reach of man and his actions are limited. If we think that we are beyond the reach of what we fear, we tend as people to push aside that fear and at times even mock it. Now for those of you who are younger, think back with me to Tom and Jerry. Remember those episodes where we find Tom running away from the one thing that he fears the most? Spike, the dog. And remember those times where Tom is being chased by Spike and suddenly we see Spike being yanked violently, violently back by his collar because he has literally reached the end of his rope? Well, what does Tom do at that moment? Does he continue to run, scurrying away for his life? No. We see Tom stopping and actually walking back towards Spike. He eventually finds the limit of Spike's reach. He draws a line in the ground and he stands there and he mocks Spike in as many ways as he can try. Why? Because Tom knows that he is out of the danger zone. And that Spike, no matter how dangerous he may be, can't reach him. That he can't hurt him. Now, for those of you who are older, think way back with me to the Dukes of Hazard. Remember those episodes where Bo and Luke would be speeding along in the General Lee, trying to run away from the sheriff, Roscoe P. Coltrane? Remember those times where the Duke boys would manage to drive beyond the county line with the sheriff behind them in hot pursuit? What did Bo and Luke do, or rather, what did the sheriff do the moment they crossed that county line? Well, the sheriff would hit the brakes and stop the chase. Why? because the sheriff understood that Bo and Luke were beyond his jurisdiction. He knew that he had no authority to arrest or bring any charges against the Duke boys beyond the county line. And so once Bo and Luke crossed the county line, they knew they were beyond the reach of the sheriff, of the sheriff. and at times they even dared to stop and stare and wave at the sheriff sitting just yards away from them, shaking his fists in the air in frustration. So. No matter how scary something or someone may be, if we understand it has reached its limit, man has a tendency to forget his fear. So the fear of man is temporary, and it presents a weak argument for action and provides a poor motivation for change. However, as Jesus stands before his disciples, and he presents to them a warning and prepares them for the persecution and the hardship and the fear that they would face as they go out in the name of Christ preaching the gospel. Jesus teaches us in today's passage that the fear of God and not the fear of man is what presents a strong argument for action and provides a rich motivation for change. First of all, God is always a clear and present danger to man. God is always a clear and present danger to man. Unlike a policeman who can only be present at limited times and places, God is present everywhere and every when. God always sees he knows our thoughts, our desires, our words, 
and our actions. There is nothing that escapes God's notice. We must understand that there is no time, there is no place where God is not ever present with us. Not in our cars, not in our offices, not in our bedrooms, not in our bathrooms, not on the internet. Not even in the most private or secret places that we may have. God is always ready to see and bring judgment upon our transgressions of the law. Every time we sin, God sees it. And He is ready and He is willing to bring charges against us. Jesus says in verses 29 through 30, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Here, Jesus clearly reminds us that God knows and sees everything. There are thousands, maybe millions of sparrows, these little brown birds in our world. They weren't worth much in Jesus' time and maybe even worth less in our time. But God has an eye on each and every one of them where not even one could fall from the sky dead apart from him. Now, if God takes such an interest and care to know the sparrows, how much more must we realize that God takes care to know us, who truly are more valuable? Jesus even takes a step further and tells us that God knows us so well that he's actually counted and numbered the hairs on our heads. Now, granted... God probably has an easier time with that now than when I was younger because I've sadly witnessed the number of hairs on my head decrease through the years. But it's amazing to know that God knows exactly how many strands of hair I have on my head. God knows me. God knows you intimately that well, because he is with us all the time, in all the places, seeing all that we are and all that we do. And nothing escapes his gaze, nothing escapes his judgment. So in verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples and us today that we need not fear man whose knowledge is limited, whose power is limited, but rather we must fear. And please understand that the word fear here that Jesus uses is the word from which we derive our expression phobia. A literal terror of God who knows and sees all things. Second of all, God is omnipotent and his reach and judgment over us are not limited. There are no ropes or chains that hold God back. There are no boundaries that limit the authority of God. Man may be limited in what he can do to other men. And Jesus clearly illustrates this in verse 28 by reminding his disciples that man, no matter how brutal he may be, cannot go beyond killing the body. Man can kill the body. But he cannot kill the soul. However, God's power and judgment are without limit. They are eternal and go beyond even death itself. In verse 28, Jesus also reminds the disciples that God can kill and take the life of a man here on earth. But... He also possesses the power and authority to continue to destroy or ruin the body and the soul forever in hell. There is no escaping God's authority. There is no fleeing beyond God's judgment. 
not even death will be able to separate man from God's vengeance and condemnation upon those who sin against him. Not even death. Because God is everywhere, and the danger of his judgment is ever-present, and because there is absolutely no way to escape beyond the reach of his judgment, for those of us who know that God does live, the fear of God truly provides a strong argument for action and a rich motivation for change. The knowledge that God sees everything and that he will judge everything we do should convince us it should if we understand that who God is and what God can do. It should convince us. And knowing that we can never escape God's judgment, it should motivate us to live in obedience to God all the time. And at this moment, some of you here may be saying to yourself, John, I know that God lives. You don't have to convince me of that. I know that God sees and knows everything I do. And I know I need to live my life in obedience to God because I do fear God's eternal judgment. But what am I to do? I'm not perfect. I sin all the time, and I know it. God knows it. What hope is there for me? Am I supposed to live the rest of my life constantly looking behind my shoulder in fear of God's impending judgment? Or even worse, fearing that I will be condemned to suffer body and soul forever in hell? Now, if Jesus would have ended with verse 31, I too would have to end here and reply. Yes, we have no hope because we are all sinners under the judgment of God. And the only fate that awaits us is eternal suffering in body and soul forever in hell. And I would have the displeasure of standing here before you, nothing more than a messenger of bad news. But, praise God. Praise God, because Jesus doesn't end here. He doesn't stop with verse 31. Jesus doesn't leave his disciples and he doesn't leave us trembling, overcome by the fear of God. No. He continues on and he brings us to the love and the grace of God. In verse 32, Jesus says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Here Jesus declares to all sinners, to all of us, the good news. He tells us that freedom from the fear of God's judgment can be found. He tells us that freedom from the judgment of God who can destroy both soul and body in hell is not found in what we can do or cannot do, but rather in what he will do. If we acknowledge Jesus, if we confess by faith that we have a relationship with Christ, that we are in him and that he is in us, we will be saved. As Paul writes in Romans 10, 9 through 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? The judgment of God. And he continues in verse 10, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Before whom? Before the heavenly Father. But why? Because Jesus promises to acknowledge us before the heavenly Father. Jesus promises to confess before the Father that he, Christ the Son of God, has a relationship with us that he loves us and has redeemed us as his own. In other words, even though we are sinners who deserve God's eternal judgment, because of Jesus Christ, who acknowledges us as his own, God the Father in heaven will accept us and give us the right to become the children of God. And as we're reminded today in our scripture reading, Nothing, not even death itself, will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. On September 9th, 2001, the United States of America was scared by terrorists seeking to drown our country in terror. But they didn't succeed. Because instead of running away in fear, the fear experienced that day only succeeded in rallying the people of our country to stand unified in the fight against terrorism and proclaim, we will never forget. On September 9, 2015, however, many in our country have proven that the fear caused by man is temporary and limit it in its impact to bring about change in ourselves and in our world. But where the fear of man has proven powerless, the fear of God should be more than powerful enough to compel all men to change. But sadly, man cannot change because all men are sinners. Hence, the most powerful impact that the fear of God can have on man is to bring all men to see their need for a Savior who alone is Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So, if we truly desire change in ourselves, in others, and in our country. Let us acknowledge today that what we need is to call all men to remember and never forget. Not the fear of man, not the terror of men, but rather the fear of God, so that all men may come to know their need for a Savior who is Jesus Christ the Lord. I end with this quote. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Let's pray.